A very good morning to you, church family members. Good morning. Our scripture um, today is from Mark 4, 1 through 20. But before we hear the word, let us pray. Beloved God, open our hearts to your healing word, our minds to your informing word, our souls to your renewing word. May we be strengthened to live out your love in word and deed. Amen. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. Such a very loud crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the sea and sat there while the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables. And in his teachings, he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing, and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, Let anyone with ears to hear listen. When he was alone, those who were around him, along with the twelve, asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root, and endure only for a while. Then, when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it, and bear fruit thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. This is the word of the Lord.
So Jesus tells us that we're expected to bear fruit. So what does that mean, and how can we do it so that we honor his desire in our lives on this particular matter? Back in the 70s, a man and his wife were driving through Cape Cod when they spotted a field loaded with blueberries all over the place. They stopped and proceeded to eat their fill. And as they got to turn back to their car, the husband noticed that the rear door was open, and in the back sat a Cape Codder munching away at the cantaloupe that they bought at the fruit stand. <laughs> hey, shouted the husband, that's my cantaloupe. The old fellow swallowed a bite that he had in his mouth and said with a nod in the direction of the field, them's my blueberries. <laughs> Those tourists had treated the field of blueberries as if it belonged to them, but the field didn't belong to them, the blueberries didn't belong to them. So first, likewise, there are people who forget that God is kind of like a farmer. He owns everything. He owns everything because he created everything. Even more importantly, he owns us. When we became Christians, we gave ourselves over to him. When we confessed that he was now our Lord and Master, we were declaring that we now belong to Jesus. When we confess our faith as Christians, we, you could say, put on Christ and said to Christ, you own me. You own every part of me. Paul writes in Romans 4, saying, So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. So in other words, Jesus died for us. He, you could say, bought us, and because of that, he owns us and has the right to expect that we will bear fruit. He has every right to expect that we will be productive with what he has given us. In fact, through Jesus' ministry, throughout it, he constantly talked about the fact that we should bear fruit. John 15, 16 says, you did not choose me, I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And then if we look at Matthew 12, 33, it says, make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For the tree is recognized by its fruit. And then John 15, 4 and 5 says this, Remain in me, and I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. For I am the vine, and you are the branches. If anyone remains in me, and I in them, they will bear much fruit. So in fact, what Jesus is going on further to declare is in John 15, 1 and 2, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. So what that tells us is bearing fruit is a serious thing with God. Then secondly, that brings us to the text this morning, and I especially want to emphasize Mark 4.8. Still others fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, and even a hundredfold. Now what does that mean? One man read the point out that reaping more than we sow is fundamental, a fundamental law of harvesting. Every farmer lives by that principle. If his work is only returning exactly what he planted, his labors would be fruitless. He would never gain anything extra from his efforts, so he could not use it to feed his family or to sell it for a profit. So consider the potential of one kernel of corn. One kernel of corn will produce one corn stock. Each stock produces an ear of corn. The average ear of corn has 250 kernels. 
So that single kernel of corn yields a 250% increase. Now, you know, different plants produce different numbers of kernels or seeds depending on what type of plants they are, but they will all produce a crop that is more than what was planted. Or as Jesus said, they grow and produce a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 fold. So what Jesus is telling us is this, if the true seed of the kingdom has been planted in our hearts, we will bear fruit. And when we bear fruit, it will yield far more than a single seed that was planted in our heart to begin with. That is what God expects of us. He expects us to bear fruit. Then thirdly, so what constitutes fruit in our lives? Well, there are three things that I could find described in Scripture. First was, we're expected to bear fruit in our attitudes. If you look at Galatians 20, 5, 22 to 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And then if you look a little more understanding about fruit of the Spirit, by what's contrasted with in Galatians 5, 14 to 21, Paul implied that the Galatian church had people that were too happy with each other. I thought that was interesting. But it summed up the entire law in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? If you keep on, but if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. The contrast, I guess. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Immortality, Purity, wickedness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, wild partying, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if we're bearing fruit of the Spirit, then, we're not going to be biting and devouring other Christians. We're not going to have hatred in our hearts toward others. We're not going to be jealous or envious of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We won't have anything to do with anything that would divide the church or create dissension in the congregation. Instead, as Galatians 5, 22 to 23 tells us, that bearing the fruit of the Spirit means these things. We're going to seek to create an atmosphere of love around ourselves. We're going to work to create an atmosphere of joy in the church. We'll be a peacemaker when people are mad at each other. We'll have patience with others that are hard to get along with. We'll be kind even to those around us who don't deserve it. And on and on and on. But the fruit of the Spirit is reminding us is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And as Jesus said, you'll know a tree by its fruit. And you seriously want to bear good fruit on this issue. Secondly then, now your attitude will lead to your actions. Paul wrote, we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. Colossians 1.10 in other words, when you bear fruit, you will be doing things. You will be doing good works. You will be doing good things for Jesus. These good works won't save you. You've already been saved. Nor should you think of them as actions that you can do, getting something more out of God or something. You don't use good works to negotiate with God. No, these good works are just the byproducts of a grateful heart. These are the things you do because you love Jesus. On a sweltering summer day, a mother was scooping ice cream into cones and told her four children they could buy a cone from her for a hug. For a hug. So almost immediately the kids ran over to make up, take a purchase. 
The three youngest gave their mother a quick hug, grabbed their cones, and raced back outside. But when her teenage son, at the end, lined up, finally got his turn to buy his ice cream, he gave her two hugs. And he smiled and said, keep the change. <laughs> keep the change. Bearing fruit is doing things for God because you love Him, not because you have to. Because you want to say also, keep the change, right? That's what it means to produce the fruit of good works. Then thirdly, so bearing the fruit of God involves attitudes and actions. And those attitudes and actions will hopefully lead to the last aspect of how we can bear fruit for God. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of righteousness.